All right, let's kick things off here. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Los Alamos National Laboratories pitches from their entrepreneurs. Uh, we are FedTech and we are your hosts today. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great lineup of scientists and you're gonna to get to hear directly from them and ask them questions about their technology today. So as we get started, uh, our quick agenda for today's session, we'll start with some Zoom housekeeping, the basics so you know what you need to know about the platform. We'll introduce the program. We have a wonderful keynote address from the NNSA, Deputy Director, Dr. Kevin Greenaw. Pitches, of course, from our three postdocs, and then we will end today's session with some breakout room networking. So your housekeeping to kick us off. If Teams, uh, if Zoom would go down at all, we will have a Teams link that will send out. So just keep an eye out for your email. Knock on wood, I don't think that will happen, but just in case we do have that backup plan in place should, should Zoom crash. Uh, mute and video. So everybody does have the option to come off of mute. Please keep yourself muted when you're not talking. You will be called upon during the Q&A session. So keep your video on now if you'd like so the postdocs can see you as they're pitching, but keep yourself on mute until the Q&A portion of the session. And also the chat is active and live, so feel free to put any questions, anything you wanna say in that chat. And then lastly, during the Q&A sessions after each pitch, you'll hit that raise hand button and you can get there by clicking the bottom tab participants and then raise hand. That will allow us to see who would like to speak next We'll call on you so you can ask your question directly. So at this time, I would love to introduce uh, the founder and managing partner of FedTech uh, to tell us a little bit more about why we're here today. So Ben Solomon, take it away. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, hi, greetings to everybody. Uh, great to be with you. So this is actually the fourth year that we've hosted this pitch event for uh, Los Alamos and um, one of our absolutely favorite lab partners along with NNSA. And um, yeah, just so, so normally, you know, we'd be uh, in person, usually in our, our DC office um, serving, you know, wine and, and beer and uh, food and, and enjoying some great technology pitches. We'll, we'll hopefully be back uh, by this time next year, you know, in, in, to doing this event in person, but certainly great to see everyone in a virtual sense. Um, so just a, a couple words on who we are uh, at FedTech. So we really do several things. Every, every aspect of our, our business is accelerating technologies like the ones you're going to see today from a lab environment, from a, a research environment to become real products, become real businesses and, and create real economic value. So that's kind of uh, spread across four different programs. So our startup studio program, we're really, um, it's a pleasure we get to interact really, really closely with Dr. Greenow's group at NNSA. Um, and that's where we'll take inventions from research labs like Los Alamos and spin them off into new companies. And we do that by recruiting outside entrepreneurial founders really proud of that. Uh, we also run a number of other just accelerators that are more seed and series A stage companies, um, in addition to running internal programs. So we work closely with NASA researchers, we work with researchers across the Department of Defense to be more entrepreneurial. And then lastly, um, we do work a lot with big companies uh, on filling their innovation pipeline. So really, um, if you are unfamiliar with us, please check out our website. There's a lot of opportunities to get involved in our programs. If you are an aspiring entrepreneur, we want to hear from you. We, we want you to apply uh, to participate in our programs. We can pair you up with, with uh, co-founders, with uh, technology opportunities that you can license. Um, we make all of that uh, really accessible. So if you're an entrepreneur, please hit, hit us up. Um, if you're someone that wants to mentor and help entrepreneurs. We, we love that. There's tons of opportunities. Again, you can apply uh, through our website. Uh, and then if you come from the research world, um, if you represent a research lab, uh, we'd love to talk to you about how we can help uh, enable your mission and um, help you commercialize. So, uh, and th then last plug is just our, our team uh, at, at FedTech. We're based in DC, but right now have staff uh, all across the country, really. We are growing. Um, so we are hiring uh, and anyone that's interested, please, again, just um, look on our website and, and LinkedIn. So really, we get to see a lot of amazing programs that live at this intersection of federal R&D and entrepreneurship. And, and this uh, program through uh, UC Berkeley and LANL is, I think, one of the absolute most uh, uh, dynamic and, and unique. Um, so just to give you a sense of the journey that the postdocs have been on, uh, so it's a six-month program. 
that trains typically three to four postdocs to help assess the market around their technology. So you're taking you know, technical people and putting them into uh, an entrepreneurial based curriculum. So for those of you that have done you know, lean startup and other you know, business model canvas related activities, that's uh, uh, what the crew has done. They receive absolutely amazing training from uh, Lanel and the, and the team there at Feynman. And um, you know, by the end of the program, uh, really, you know, the goal is for these postdocs to have a strong understanding of what the market and what some of the applications for their technology could be. That manifests itself in a tons of in, in uh, uh, varying, you know, all, all equally exciting opportunities. They might license the technology out that they've been working with. They might find partners. They might start a business themselves. It's it's really um, you know uh, open, and I think you're going to see quickly that. You know, these are some of the smartest people in the world that come uh, from that that uh, you know wonderful hillside up at Lanel, and um, tons of opportunity. So you'll hear uh, shortly from Eric Davis, Tanya Elkin, and Tony Shin. Uh, and yeah, we're really excited again. Welcome uh, to to the postdocs, and and big thanks to our our partners at Lanel, uh, Molly, MJ, and uh, and team. So it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce um, one of our favorite people here at FedTech. So Dr. Kevin Greenow um, has a resume as long as my arm. So I'm going to um, attempt to do it justice uh, uh, quickly. But uh, Dr. Greenow, please forgive if I if I miss anything. Um, but Dr. Greenow is a member of the SES and um, is an assistant deputy administrator of strategic partnership programs for the National Nuclear Security Administration and NSA. Um, and most recently, he served as a senior policy to the administrator of NNSA. He manages close to two billion, with a B, uh, dollars in strategic partnership programs, which are critical to NNSA sites and um, enable uh, nuclear deterrence, non-proliferation, counterterrorism, and other uh, just amazing technology developments. NNSA has a, a very rich history of technologies leaving the labs and benefiting both government uses, but also commercial markets. Um, so he, he's really had an amazing 35 year career that's included stops at, at MITRE um, and Los Alamos. And in addition to that, he's been an adjunct professor at Howard University for over 25 years. And um, we are really grateful just to have Dr. Green out here. So thank you, sir, for being a part of the event and over to you. All right, thank you very much, Ben. I. Uh... I'd like to start my presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to look at that picture again. Uh, I think that picture is a little dated now. I, I see a little more gray in my head on the, the video than I see in this picture, but I think I'm gonna stick with that picture for a little longer. So I'd like to uh, talk to you today about technology transfer from the NNSA perspective. And let me just say that, you know, I'm. I'm very fond of Los Alamos National Laboratory. As Ben stated, I started my career there over 35 years ago. And so I was a nuclear engineer at Los Alamos and stayed there for about eight years. And then from there, I, I moved on to the Washington DC area. And so I'm very fond of being on the Hill and talking to people that are on the Hill and the things that you're doing on the Hill, the great things that you're doing. Uh, let's go to the next slide. What I'd like to start off with is just saying that technology transfer has been with the weapons program from the beginning. And so when you look at the Manhattan Project and what was going on there, there were so many technologies that were being developed. Many of those technologies were associated with energy production. I have a picture here of a nuclear power plant. This is not one of the older ones, but uh, you had it for technologies for electricity electricity production, medical equipment, things of that nature, all those things came out of the weapons program. And then when you look at, think about it, there's been con considerable contributions since then. Um, if you look at some of the things surrounding clean room technology, which enables the production of cell phones and the microelectronics associated with cell phones, those things were capabilities that came from the weapons program. On the next slide, I'd like to say that NNSA was founded and one of the primary missions of the NNSA is to support the US leadership in science and technology. And we feel that tech transfer is a way of achieving that. And so 
Uh, therefore, when you look at our laboratories, they're federally funded research and development centers, the three physics laboratories, and then also our plants. They're not FFRDCs, but they have a lot of language in their contracts that are that's FFRDC-like lang language. And so when you look at it, we are trying to make sure that we are providing the technologies for nuclear deterrence, non-proliferation, counterterrorism, and nuclear propulsion, but also we contribute to the broader U.S. national security activities and the U.S. economy. Next slide. We look at all of our sites in the enterprise as a national treasure. Uh, Los Alamos is by far the first and the greatest treasure of all. And so we are, I, 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 again, I, I just like the, the opportunity to talk to you uh, and the people that are there at Los Alamos. But all of the sites are national treasures that we believe are very important relative to the overall mission and overall enterprise. Next slide. I'd like to say a little something about the fact that we have a number of programs at, for an example, Los Alamos, and these programs would include the strategic partnership projects, which is work for others. We have the technology transfer program. We have the weapons R&D programs. We have the laboratory directed research and development programs. All these programs provide the people, the infrastructure, the experimental capabilities, the computational capabilities to be able to do our mission. And that is those things that I outlined relative to nuclear deterrence, et cetera. But then also those capabilities are there and positioned to respond to and assess a variety of national security and US economy technology needs. Uh, when you look at the laboratory strategic site plans, one of the key components in those plans is technology transfer. And they plan it in a strategic manner and make sure that it's complementary to our primary missions at our laboratories. Next slide. So if you look at how we look at it and how we define technology transfer, it's the process by which knowledge, facilities, and capabilities developed under the federal R&D funding are used to fulfill public and private needs. Now, this is a definition that we took from the Federal Laboratory Consortium for technology transfer. But the other thing that we like to acknowledge is it's the law. And when I say it's the law, we're mandated that by the stevenson Wyland Technology Innovation Act that we have to, if we're receiving funding R&D funding from the government, then we have to have programs to be able to transfer that technology. And, and, and a 10.1, the organization that I lead uh, is the primary organization for the commercialization activities. Now, what technology transfer can be accomplished in a number of different ways through commercialization and licensing and patents, through cooperative research and, and development agreements, through intellectual exchanges, through publications, entrepreneurial leave, and things of that nature. And when you look at the process of technology transfer, you see the various aspects on this wheel here, which starts with discovery and then ends with public use, financial, and technical returns. Uh, next slide. So what we did, what we've done in NA 10.1 is that we said, if we're responsible for technology transfer across the enterprise, let's strategically approach this. And the way that we've st strategically approached this is that we developed a strategic framework. And within that framework, we have six strategic goals. And there's a number of activities for these strategic goals. And our strategic goals are technology development, commercialization, and maturation goal. Uh, we have a workforce development, recru recruitment, and retention goal. Uh, we have policy evaluation and economic development goal. And then we have public branding goal. That is a goal where we want to be looked at similar to how NASA is looked at relative to Tang. We want to say, look, we're known for, we are, various technologies are associated with NNSA. Uh, for the broader national uh, 
economy. And so that's one of the, the, the branding. We have a number of things that we've done. We've developed calendars. We've developed a book. Uh, all those things are trying to brand NNSA as a technology transfer generating entity. And then we also have outreach and collaboration through our open campuses and other vehicles of that nature where since we're many times in a classified environment, we want to be able to enable academia companies to come in to collaborate with us. And we try to do that by establishing open campuses for them to come in and be able to achieve that. And then the last one is one of the strategic goals that we just recently added, but it's so important. And that's prote protection of American technologies. And so we have initiatives throughout the Department of Energy and NNSA where we're trying to protect certain technologies from going to countries at risk. That's how we refer to them. And that is, we want to make sure that our technologies are not stolen by other, other countries, for an example. And so there are a number of activities that we're doing relative to the protect protection of American technologies. Next slide. So one of the objectives that we have also is that we'd like to have an environment so, so that it's conducive to spin out technologies and then spin them back in to help our primary mission. And so when I say that, I'm saying we're, we're talking about technologies, we're talking about understanding and knowledge that goes out to other agencies, that goes out to companies and then is matured and developed further. And then at some point, many of these technologies we're, we're hoping will spin back into our programs to support our primary missions of weapons, non-proliferation, et cetera. And so a healthy enterprise ensures that capabilities are available for the nation's most challenging issues. Next slide. We have a number of technologies that have done that. For an example, precision machine tools developed at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. The commercial machine tool capability produced precise machining that has spun back into the weapons program. Another one is the Dyna 3D, which is a structural type of code that was developed for the weapons program for one of our weapons. And we, worked with the uh, private industry, we worked with the automobile industry to develop that code a little further. And now that code is being used not only for our weapons program, but it's also being used within the automobile industry relative to collision analysis. And I guess safety design. And then another example is our battery supply chain. And that is, we had uh, some individuals that left one of the laboratories understood the specifications on some of the parts that we needed for our battery supplies. And so then they, we basically, they developed a company, generated the supplies, and then we buy back those supplies into the weapons program. And so those are just some examples of activities where technology and capabilities are spinning out and then spinning back into the weapons program. Next slide. And so this slide is a slide that we've been using for some time and, and you, would, you would be surprised by the number of technologies in everyday life that were generated in the weapons laboratories and plants and sites. For an example, the, the clean room technology that I talked about a little while ago, if you look at another one is um, the computational fluid dynamics, for processing and developing diapers, the Dyna 3D that I talked about, uh, also uh, the laser eye surgery, which uh, when you look at the wavefront sensing technology, metrology technology, and how it contributed to laser eye surgery. And so all of those things were technologies that were developed at our laboratories, plants, and sites, and they were commercialized and therefore in, improved our, our everyday life. Uh, next slide. And so what I'd like to highlight is some technologies that have just recently been 
developed at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We have a 2020 R&D 100 winner. And this was a capability to be able to model surface, subsurface, physical process um, and environmental systems across multiple scales. And so this is a very good technology that was developed at Los Alamos. And I have two other ones. Uh, let's go to the next one. This one is a smart micro bio cell technology. And this is uh, a, a biocatalyst that enhances the rate of chemical reactions, critical in pharmaceuticals, renewable energy, and environmental cleanup. And then the last one that I have is a 2020 R&D 100 award winner, which is a spectroscopic detection of nerve agents. And so that was developed also, and that I wanted to bring to your attention. And then the last slide that I have is a slide that basically says that, you know, we have a number of initiatives and some of the activities that I'm outlining right here are activities that are part of our strategic framework and part of what is in place to meet our strategic goals. And so we have an energy i core which is trying to meet our training aspect of our strategic goals for in our strategic framework. We have our agreement with FedTech, with help, which helps with the commercialization of technologies. And that is, again, an activity uh, within our strategic goal and our strategic framework. We have a technology maturation grant program where there are a number of technologies that have reached or are victim of the valley of death that they are at the early TRLs, tech readiness levels, and are not do not receive resources to expand to the further technology readiness levels. And so therefore, what we do is we provide grants to help them to mature and take those technologies from a TRL to three to four, five, six. And then we have also our economic impact studies where we've partnered with TechLink to try to understand from what are the economic impacts from our technologies on a US scale, not only the from a money perspective, but then also jobs. And that this is something that is very important and especially in light of the fact that you always have the congressional people that are coming to us and saying, well, what are you doing in our district? And what are you doing from a national perspective? And by looking at and doing analyses of this nature, we can say, well, look, the work that is being funded at this site, at this laboratory, has generated so many revenues and created so many jobs. And that's always something that's very beneficial when you're trying to get funding, uh, uh, government funding. And so that's where I'd like to end. And so I'd like to say to each of you, uh, good luck in your presentations. I, I'm looking forward to hearing them. And I, I, I commend you for all of the, the great work that I know that you have done uh, to get to this point. So with that, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenow. We greatly appreciate you joining us. I do want to point out for everyone in the audience that uh, you sent us that picture of you. So I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that you can you can say that, you can joke, but I want everyone to know you sent that to us, okay? <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much though for providing all that context uh, as we head into our pitches now. Uh, Eric Davis is actually going to kick us off. I hope everybody uh, is thirsty because his is very, very much related. It's something close, near and dear to my heart. So Eric, I'll stop my share now and let you take away the show here. Alrighty, thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Eric Davis, and I'm one of the uh, postdoc entrepreneur fellows, and my technology is called SonaView, which allows you to see the unseen in your beer production. So our overall value proposition is that we save breweries time and money through smarter fermentation and slurry dump automation, and I'll explain those problems in detail on the next slide. 
So we did a lot of customer discovery with breweries and distilleries to figure out what problems that they face on a regular basis and what they find is the area that they need the most help in. And what we found is that fermentation is the one part of their production process that they really need uh, technology on. And so some of the things that we found out is that they lose the most beer during fermentation. So that's their biggest source of loss. Uh, and then getting more into the heart of the problems, we found that measuring fermentation progress in real time is extremely beneficial to them as nearly everything is manual at this point. So to demonstrate that, you can see in the middle picture that the guy is pointing, uh, pouring some beer into a, a measuring device. Basically, he's taking a specific gravity measurement. And so that's how they kind of determine how the fermentation is done today, uh, because fermentation is a process that can take several days. And so they'll take a sample like that, you know, maybe every six hours or so. Uh, and the issue with that is that they don't really have good precision on when the fermentation is actually done. And so they can be fermenting for even a day or two longer than they really need to, uh, simply because they don't have an automated solution and they're causing a lot of manual labor for someone having to actually take these samples. Um, so that's something that they really wanted some technology to help them on. Uh, and then the last problem that uh, we wanted to address is something called a yeast slurry dump. So after the fermentation progress is done, they have what's called a conical fermentation tank where all the yeast settles at the bottom uh, and they need to drain it. And they have a valve at the bottom to which they drain it out of. Uh, so you can see that on the right picture is that guy is doing a yeast slurry dump and that's how it looks like when the yeast slurry is coming out. So the issue with that uh, is that they told us that everyone judges when to stop draining by site. So how much beer I lose depends on who is working that day. So what they mean by that is that at some point that yeast slurry stops coming out and your beer starts to pour out. And you can imagine liquid beer is going to come out very fast out of that valve. The issue is that this is a process that takes anywhere from 30 seconds to 30 minutes. So you can imagine it's very difficult to pay very good attention and have your hand on that valve for that long. And so basically the amount of beer that they're going to lose from this process can be massive if someone is not laser focused on the process. Um, and so basically quantifying this, we found that they expect about 10% fermentation cost savings from that monitoring capability, about 25% faster turnaround on batches, allowing them to get more batches in with the same capital equipment. And then they can save hundreds to thousands of gallons of beer per year, simply automating those processes. So the solution is external automated fermentation and slurry dump monitoring devices. So basically we are taking our acoustic technology and adapting it to operate on the conical fermentation tanks that are very common in the industry, like on the right side of the picture. Uh, so we aim to provide real-time monitoring of key fermentation parameters to these brewmasters so that they can really monitor their fermentation in real time, automate the slurry dumps for minimal product loss during that process, provide better quality assurance for more consistent batches so that their fermentations basically are the same uh, throughout. And then finally provide the brewmasters with data-driven insights so that they can improve their uh, batches in the future from what they've learned from the past. So our technology is what's called an acoustic multi-phase flow sensor. This is a proven technology. Uh, Lano owns over 20 patents on the technology. It has been basically successfully applied to many different problems from DOD to industry over 15 years of the tech development and over $60 million has been spent on its R&D to date. Uh, so a lot of people have really believed in the, in the technology and it has really helped out a lot of industries. And so basically very quickly how it works is that we have a sensor on one side of either a flowing pipe or a static vessel like a fermentation tank. And it sends in an acoustic burst into this container and it travels through the fluid and it goes into a sensor on the opposite side. We use some signal processing, which gives us a lot of the physical information about what's inside the pipe or the container, as well as information about the pipe or container itself. And that's physical properties that we can use to determine what is inside the container uh, and tell, us, tell you the composition as well as if it's flowing and you can see the flow rate. 
Uh, so basically the reason why this is an important technology is that this is the only non-invasive acoustic based technology that can measure both flow and composition. Flow is something common. However, a non-invasive composition meter is extremely rare technology. And so this uh, fills a very big need in a lot of industries. So the benefits of this technology for this particular application is that it ends the fermentation and slurry processes precisely when they are meant to be finished. So this means that you're decreasing the turnaround time of these different batches. Uh, it removes the speculation of when the batch is finished so you don't have you can have better planning and better operational awareness. It saves you beer. Uh, from the slurry dump process, it improves the consistency of your batches from batch to batch, and those things all combine to increase your profit, which is obviously the bottom line that they're interested in. So the market opportunity, basically, uh, there's around 8,764 craft breweries operating in the U.S. in 2020, and they're producing over 6.5 billion barrels of beer a year. Uh, so we calculate about a $400 million initial service attainable market that's growing very rapidly. And basically we get this because there's about 4,500 breweries in our target market range, uh, the ones that are large enough to produce over 10,000 gallons of beer, beer a year. So those are the ones that we're targeting that have enough money and want the automation for these types of uh, technologies. And so these breweries own a combined about 40,000 fermentation tanks that are the perfect candidates for these fermentation slurry and analytics products. And over time, we would also introduce new products targeting contaminants in distilleries, miners, and soft drinks. Basically, these are parallel markets that would require very little additional development to get these uh, added devices into those markets. So the competitive landscape, there are a few uh, competitors that are mostly startups in the actual fermentation monitoring uh, market. Uh, ARGS is the only 100% truly non-invasive technology that sits on the outside of the tanks. It does not uh, mess with the brew whatsoever. Uh, our product cost is significantly lower than the competitors and it's lower than having to do the manual labor over the time of the year. Uh, so it's relatively cost efficient. Uh, it's very easy to install because it just goes over the existing equipment. And since it's acoustic based, the maintenance is extremely low compared to optical techniques, which basically require you to clean the optics and, and, and keep those components very clean. And so the take home message is that we provide comparable or better performance at a much more palatable price point that these breweries are willing and able to pay. So, um, Basically, the business model with that, we, we would be doing product sales directly to the breweries, working on them to make sure that these products work for their particular case. Uh, recurring revenue could look like, uh, basically, we would be adding advanced data analytics subscription packages to provide this recurring revenue. We would take the existing sensors, be able to get additional data from there, and then try to uh, give the brewmasters analytics that they might be interested in. Uh, that they can pay, you know, a recurring fee for. Uh, and then we would be adding new product lines, as I said, over time that target these parallel markets. So this would be building in products uh, over time and, and growing the business that way for a startup scenario. So the go-to-market case, basically, we expect to have a bench prototype by September of this year. Uh, we're working on getting the bench prototype right now. A uh, field prototype would be shortly after that, by the end of this year. We would be looking at doing field trials with local breweries that are interested in, we, that we've already talked to by the beginning of next year. And then we would be looking at uh, transitioning this technology out of the lab uh, by roughly March of next year. And then finally looking at an early product sale, hopefully by the end of 2022. And so the base technology has a high TRL, uh, uh, that it's built upon. The application specific is lower. However, we are working very rapidly towards a fence prototype and that uh, TRL will raise quite quickly. So looking at some possible preliminary financial projections, expecting that this would be a startup, for example, we would expect that the first year would have very few products sold as you would be mostly working on development. So you would only be working on establishing the relationships with the breweries and letting them test it out. But once you have some you know, initial customers that you can use as uh, cases, you would expect that the next year you would be selling significantly more. Uh, and then by that point, you would start ramping up your number of sales by simply adding sales staff 
going out there, talking to the breweries individually. And you would expect to see basically a break even at about year four is when you would expect that you finally start selling enough that you, uh, that you outpace your expenses. And then after that, you expect that it starts to grow even more as, as products go online and you start to really get in the groove of uh, selling to these new customers. And so we would expect that about a $2 million total raise would result in about a company that's larger than $5 million in revenue by year five. So we are looking for interested partners that can either help us uh, further our customer discovery uh, in this market segment, you know, with breweries, distilleries, wineries, and soft drinks, uh, kind of to refine our models, you know, figure out exactly where we can go in, uh, how we can help the best and provide the most value, uh, but also expedite the technology and product development. That would be through tech maturation opportunities, licensing, uh, as well as partnerships. And so if you are interested in collaborating and licensing, please contact us. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. We'll all give you a, a virtual applause. You can hit that reaction applause button to give it up for Eric. Uh, I know that's not something people normally do at pitches, but uh, great job, uh, Eric. Uh, we wanna open it now, open the floor up to Q&A questions. So you can hit that participant button on the side and there's a raise hand option. So if you'd like to raise your hand, you can come off mute. You can also turn your camera on if you'd like at this time to ask Eric a question directly. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that chat. Uh, if you want to post a question in the chat, that is also uh, an option as well. So Eric, I'll start out with the first question as people start to think there is when you were defining your problem statement, how did you know that there was such a need in this niche of a market in the beer industry specifically? How did you discover that problem? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So uh, we basically kind of had a hammer that had you know, had many nails that it, that it had applied to. And we were, we knew that there was uh, some need in the industry because uh, typically technology had overlooked the alcohol industry. And so I didn't know the particular problem. I just knew that the industry almost certainly had a need. And so I contacted many breweries basically, and we found that, you know, we didn't tell them about our technology. We asked them, what are your problems? And we found that they kept coming up with the same problems without prompting. They kept mentioning the exact same things, almost word for word. And they had the, almost the exact same idea about how much it would help them. Uh, so after talking to, you know, the fifth, sixth brewery, it's like, okay, clearly this is a common issue because after talking to, you know, multiple breweries, you know, multiple different sizes, they all have about the same, same thing to say. So we figured that it was a very good problem to solve simply because um, so many of them had the same issue. So as you were doing your customer discovery and doing those stakeholder interviews, was there any patterns or things that emerged that you had to pivot along this journey that you've had to change as you've learned more? Yeah, so um, initially we were actually focused on distilleries uh, simply because we were, we were trying to focus more on, and that's also where I got the idea for the alcohol industries through a, a distillery uh, a tour. Um, we were looking more at doing uh, like contamination, uh, uh, real inline contamination for distilleries, but distilleries also do fermentation. And, and some of the distilleries we talked to said, you know, you should really talk to breweries because we know that they would be even more interested in your technology. You can help us, but we know you can definitely help them as well. So at that point, I started to canvas a lot more breweries and we found that indeed the breweries even have a greater, uh, equal or greater uh, uh, interest in our technology. And so that's where we really started evolving our, our product statements, uh, you know, our, our, sorry, problem statement, uh, and really getting to the heart of what problem that we wanted to solve with our technology. Great, Eric, thank you. We actually have a question from Matt Wolf. So I'm gonna ask you to un unmute Matt and, uh, and ask your question. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, nice presentation, Eric. I actually had a couple of questions if I could. One is, um, this work has been, the underlying technology has been worked on for, for many years, as you said. How much uh, time is left on the patents um, uh, for your protection? Uh, that's one question. Um, another would be, um, would, would you expect one device to be added to each fermentation tank or could one, is it a mobile unit that could be used 
um, you know, and be moved around within a brewery, for example. And then third is, is there any calibration that has to happen depending on what type of beer is being brewed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those are all very good questions. Uh, um, so basically, uh, I'll go with the last question since it's freshest in my mind. Uh, so yeah, so there would be a calibration period that would basically need to see one fermentation uh, by itself. Um, you know, not telling the brewmaster anything, uh, basically to get an idea of the batches that they're running. Uh, we would expect that the technology would get smarter over time as it sees more batches. But after a few times of them basically doing their usual operations, we would expect that it would kick in and then you can automate your, your procedure from then on. That would just be to make sure that it's really, uh, you know, going in with that particular brewery's operations uh, and, and their batches that, that they're doing, because the beer does really, you know, vary from brewery to brewery. So, so we would expect that, yeah, they would have to calibrate it for each different product line that they would have. Uh, your other question in terms of, uh, um, yeah, so, so it, ideally it would be one per tank and you would basically permanently affix it. And then uh, uh, that would give you the information from that tank from then on out. And so we would like to instrument all of the tanks and we're targeting a price point that allows brewmasters to do all of their tanks with this technology. And so we would expect that they would probably wire up one or two as like a trial. And then as they see that technology works, they would be coming back and adding additional tanks until their entire brewery is uh, wired out. Now, it could be movable. Um, it's just that that's not really the intention um, because we would, because part of the idea is that this technology frees up a particular tank faster so that they can use that tank over and over again, you know, with, with higher turn, you know, their turnaround time is less for that tank. So uh, they could, but that would defeat part of the purpose um, of it. And then the final thing uh, in terms of the patents, yes, it has been developed uh, for a long time because it's been applied to so many different uh, applications, both from uh, chemical weapons uh, detection as well as uh, oil and gas applications. So some of the patents are specific to the applications. However, uh, patents are still rolling into this day. So if you if you look back five, five years from now, there may be 30 patents on it. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, we continually refine the, the, the technology and the latest patents on the technology with the very best uh, 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 science behind it are fresh. Uh, in fact, our most comprehensive patent on the base technology uh, just got issued, I believe, last year, like November of last year. And so this has plenty of pat patent coverage left. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. And thank you very much for your question, Matt. Uh, we have a few more questions in the chat, but unfortunately time is up. So uh, Eric, we'll make sure that you have those notes in the chat at the end. And of course you have his contact information directly there on screen. If you want to take a screenshot of it to be able to ask your question and engage with, with Eric directly. But again, uh, congratulations. Thank you. That was a wonderful pitch. Uh, and we are now going to move on to our next presenter here. So allow me to screen share. And I'd like to introduce Tatiana Elkin, who is going to present on her technology of nano-caged enzymes and their relation to plastics uh, and her company in Peel. So Tatiana, the floor is yours for your pitch. You can start your screen share now. Hey, hello everybody. Um, all right. All right, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity. My name is uh, Tanya and I'm one of the um, entrepreneurial postdoc in Los Alamos. And I will tell you today how Impil can help us reduce the plastic waste around the world. But first, let me- You're not, sorry to interrupt you, you're not screen sharing. Can you hit that screen share button again for us just so we can make sure we can see your presentation? Sure. Oh. No problem, I heard your mouse click, but no worries, we'll have that up in just a second. Yes, share. There we go, all right. All right, sorry about that. Um, so uh, my name is Tanya and I will present you today the NPIL, uh, the uh, high recovery of plastic waste and technology. 
And before we go into the recycling, let's first understand why plastic recycling is a problem. Well, first of all, it is really not a secret that uh, plastics are what makes the modern way of life possible. In fact, I don't think that any of us can imagine the everyday life without the plastic bottle or a soda can or a piece of clothing, furniture, infrastructural um, piece of um, equipment. They are all made entirely or at least in part out of the plastics. In fact, we're producing about 3 million ton plastics a year, which is a lot. And this number only grows from year to year. And the true problem is not that we're producing about uh, um, the weight of 110 Liberty statues with the concrete and all in a year and adding a couple new each year. The problem is how much of it we cannot recirculate back. In fact, only three to 7% out of a produced plastic every year ends up recycled. So we carry over the waste from the last year and add the next one and it grows and grows and grows. And uh, the problem with that is that it pollutes our environment. Uh, only oceanic uh, contamination alone is estimated to cost global economy about 2.5 billion a year. And we did not even begin to scratch the surface of uh, how much it damages the um, soil, the uh, water and the healthcare, which inevitably will rise the healthcare cost and decrease the um, healthcare um, of all the people. So how is it that we are doing our part and we put our bottle in the recycle bin and it doesn't do much? Well, we do something, only we do the tip of the tip of an iceberg and the rest ends up in the uh, polluting the environment anyway. So why isn't recycling working and how can we make it work tomorrow? So first of all, let's understand that not all plastic created equal. We produce some plastic at a much higher volume, such as for example, number five polypropylene, which is one of the most produced plastics and the PET number one, for example, and one of the least produced plastics in the world. However, for PET, we recycle the most, and this is about 19%, and only 1% of polypropylene is getting recycled. So all of this gap between the majorly produced plastic and the 1% is being dumped. The second problem is that we are tailoring the properties of the plastics to the what we need. So we cannot really mix them and match uh, for the recycling process. One recycling process will not fit all. And even worse than that, when the six major plastic types is not enough, we go ahead and we glue them together into the multi-layered plastics that cannot be separated at all. Think, for example, that the plastic bottle is only number one plastic, but the bag of chips, for example, is a multi-layered plastics. Those have a major contribution in the pollution. So the problem with the recycling, I guess, today is that we are concentrating on recycling on a macro level, meaning that we're concentrating on the final product itself, such as washing your clothes or washing your bottle and trying to recycle this final product. And there is a very, very well-defined limit to how many times you can do that before that product starts losing properties. Also, let's say our product is a glued together plastics, like a piece of clothing where one half needs to be washed and one needs to be dry cleaned. They cannot be compatible. One type of recycling will recycle one, but completely damage the other and taint the one that we've recycled. So what we need to do and what we do in the inpeel, we think about recycling on the micro level. We think about how we can take the plastic product and break it into its building blocks and then recycle them back into the economy. Basically what we're doing, we're providing you with a fresh feedstock that we've taken not from the petroleum based source and add up on whatever we already accumulated, but we take it from the trash that exists today. This way we can generate fresh plastics that we know and test today and we like using it, but we're not losing any value. In order to make it even more attractive, INPIL is based on the biologically catalytic active molecules that are called enzymes. And the way it is possible for the enzyme to work under such a harsh conditions is because we encapsulate them in a very specific cage that does not let it become inactive. It is due to this encapsulation that those enzymes become catalytically turbocharged and also are not degrading. So they can be recoverable by themselves and be useful for more and more uh, recycling cycles, if we may say. Think of it as you're using a detergent. What if you can use the same part of detergent three, four, five times? 
the price of the detergent bottle will definitely fall. The way we use it, we have a bioreactor, we can load some waste in it. Let's think of a multi-layered plastic, such as a bag of chips, that has two incompatible plastic glues together, polypropylene and polyethylene. And the enzyme then goes away and peels PET from the mixture in the uh, way of the monomer that can then be sold to the plastic industry production of PET. And the layer that is left is actually pure polyethylene and polypropylene that can then be resold to the companies that are dealing with recycling and generating a ultra high resin of polypropylene and polyethylene that will be reincorporated back into the economy. With this technology, we are looking to tap into a 120 billion market of North American uh, market alone. Of course, the global market is much larger. And the largest slice of this 120 billion uh, market is dedicated to monomers and intermediates, which is exactly the building blocks that we are producing within PIL technology. Um, again, not all plastics are created equal. And of course, polypropylene and polyethylene will not cause the same, but we know that polypropylene is produced at a much larger volume and much more of it is needed. So we can see that to recycle a ton of polypropylene and recycle a ton of PET will actually cost not the same with PET being more expensive, but polypropylene can definitely compensate for it by its volume that is needed to be procured. Only one to 3% of it will be the enzyme cost, which is the cost that they will be dedicated to uh, create this catalyst. And the rest will be redirected to the revenue of the infill company. We are not alone, but we are in a very, very good spot right now. All companies only start to emerge. And in fact, only two companies in Europe emerged in the last three years. And that is all, which is Carbios and Enzyco, who look at the enzymatic degradation of the plastics. We, of course, compel pretty well to them because we are producing the monomer and the single plastic. We allow for those recoveries and not just one of them. We are ecologically friendly. And of course, we can lower the operational cost because our enzyme is A, much more stable, B, also recoverable. And it is due to those advantages that the companies such as a Pure Cycle and Novozyme, and of course, our local New Mexican Recycling Consortium, are willing to partner with us in the future. Pure Cycle is an emerging company for polypropylene recycling. They only have one plant in Ohio and they would like to grow. In order to do that, they need a fresh supply of polypropylene that they currently do not have. And the Intel will allow to do that. Novozyme are very much interested in stabilization of energy in, or in stabilization of enzyme in order to go ahead and spread their market even further than it already is. We are fresh and we are new and we have room to grow. We are in the final stages of our customer discovery and applying for grants. And of course, we're looking for collaborations. And if anyone is interested to collaborate with us, we are welcoming you with an open arm. There's plenty of room and NPIL for anybody. In the three years following this year, uh, uh, targeted R&D, together with our partners and together with people who will allow us to do the scale up of our technology, we will be able to demonstrate the enzyme stability, to demonstrate the laboratory whale scale, and of course the pilot size scale. And with that, I would like to thank you and invite you to ask any question that you may like, and thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, everybody, you know, round of applause again uh, for another wonderful pitch. Uh, we appreciate it. So again, you can feel free to raise your hand using that participants to raise hand function. Feel free then when we call on you to come off of mute and ask your question directly, uh, or you can put that right in the chat uh, and we will read it out loud. So I'll kick us off, Tatiana, to start. Uh, as you've been going through and and going through all the different types of plastics and your enzymes, what kind of stakeholders have you engaged with throughout your process to determine your market share? And can you just go into a little bit more detail there about your stakeholders? Um, so let me just see that I understand correctly the question. So um, you're asking about how we approached our customer discovery and- uh, Yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear, we'd love to hear more about that process. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, so our crowd right now is divided into two major portions. Uh, one is the uh, current recyclers who would like to make their process uh, cheaper and safer for the workforce. And another one is actually the enzyme producing um, people. 
So we talked to them both and both of them are interested and eventually um, they will be paired up at the NPL in order to provide the combined value from the enzymatic and recycling world, if that answers the question. Yeah, that was great, thank you. So in addition to going through those customer discoveries, where do you see NPL in, you know, I, you, you gave the roadmap there, which, which is great. But uh, I'm just curious to see in terms of recycling is this big, large, huge thing. So how much uh, and how disruptive do you anticipate NPL being in that large market? Sure. Um, if I'm allowed, I will draw the um, analogy between the history of Los Alamos. So Los Alamos was born out of purely theoretical principle that was developed in the Europe. So it was non-existent. And then in very short period of time, the gadget pretty much disrupted the whole world uh, um, energy-wise and otherwise. So this is the type of technology that can completely disrupt the um, plastic waste as we look at it today. Like now, right now, we're looking at it as something that is very troublesome. Uh, this technology will allow you to look at it as a source of uh, either fuel or the same plastics that we know and love today. So. Um, my guess is it will completely shift the way that we look at uh, waste and it will completely shift the way we look at the uh, chemical production of the plastics in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm looking around, does anyone have their hand raised or feel free uh, again to raise your hand. Uh, we'd love to have some questions and uh, we have a great uh, question come into the chat. So what's the biggest challenge in making this a technology a reality? I guess the greatest challenge is to have the initial funding for it. Uh, once we have that, um, these types of technology usually have a snowball effect. I mean, they move usually pretty fast and uh, they become quite massive as they go. Great. Was there any difficult for you when you were doing your market sizing exercises as well, just because the recycling industry is such a, 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 big, a big thing. So was that a difficult part for you? It was a little bit difficult in the beginning, and then we understood that we don't really have to look at the whole recycling industry because it's kind of more of the same. Um, the um, little things change, but eventually it's like, oh, we receive waste, we sort it, we try not to poke ourselves with anything, and then we dump like 98% of it away. Um, we were actually looking at uh, what chemical recycling would bring to the table, and uh, once we narrowed that down, it became much easier and much more informative. And then we uh, narrowed down from chemical recycling to biochemical recycling. And then it became even easier and more clear what kind of path needs to be taken in order to A, make a true recycling a possibility and B, not to make the recycling process more poisonous than the plastic is, which means that we go for the eco-friendly catalyst instead of some chemical rare metal catalyst. Yeah, thank you. And okay, last question. We have 30 seconds before we're going to head to our next pitch. So uh, as you know, concise as you can, tweet size, what's the big differentiator from your technology from other ones that are similar? So what's kind of your, your secret sauce, so to speak, uh, as you know, as much as you can say publicly? <laughs> sure. Uh, our enzymes are more stable. The last time somebody did something like that, they got a Nobel Prize. We're not shooting for that. But we're shooting for changing the plastic industry. So stabilization of an enzyme, eco-friendly, and uh, all the best and all the purest of the world. Perfect. That was a perfect tweet size answer. Definitely less than 140 characters. But thank you so much for sharing your technology with us and answering a few of our questions. Uh, well done. And we are excited to see what comes next. So thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so uh, next up on the docket, uh, the theme today is just very cool technology. We go from beer to plastic enzymes and now to radiation. So I'd love to welcome now to the stage, uh, Dr. Tony Shin. So Tony, I'll stop my share and you can take over and, and take, take it away. Uh, after Tony, we will have breakout rooms. Uh, so stay tuned for that as well and some networking. All right, great. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay, uh, I hope everyone can see that. Um, <clears throat> so hi, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, my name is Tony Shin. I am uh, the third and the last postdoc 
Uh, and uh, I'm in the Intelligence Space Research Division. And before I begin, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk about Adaptimize. Uh, so Adaptimize is our software platform uh, for using unmanned vehicles specifically uh, for radiation detection and mapping. Sorry, one second here. Okay, so what we're really focused on in terms of an application space is our ability to uh, prevent as well as confirm any radiological and nuclear incidents. So these can be catastrophic, uh, both for livelihood as well as financial. Uh, so you can think Fukushima, uh, you can also think uh, radiological dispersal devices. Uh, and so the ability to quickly and also remotely confirm or prevent these incidents is really vital for our threat defense. Uh, some of our some of the key aspects that we're focused on is, of course, safety and operations for the people who are on the ground. Uh, also, the ability to survey large areas as well as hard to reach places. Uh, again, as I mentioned, recognizing these threats as soon as possible and as far away as possible uh, is really important. And lastly, for preventative measures, uh, we want to have the ability to account for these radiological materials, which, is co which coincides with nuclear safeguards. And so when we look at uh, RN threat defense and mitigation, uh, the timeliness, there's three major pillars that we're really focused on. So uh, before any incident happens, it's the, uh, the goal of prevention. So we're securing and safeguarding these radiological materials. Uh, and then when an incident does occur, uh, we are responding in real time. And so we're trying to mitigate damage, uh, of course, the personnel, but also equipment, critical assets, and facilities. Uh, lastly, uh, post-incident, the ability to monitor, continuously monitor, uh, is important for implementing decommissioning, um, as well as ensuring that that area is uh, safe for future operations. And so what we can see here is that using unmanned vehicles, which have sensors attached to them, uh, can intersect all three of these pillars. And in the last decade, there's been immense advancement in technology for unmanned vehicles. Uh, however, the issue is really, we haven't quite harnessed and utilized the advancements in uh, UAVs and U UGVs, ground vehicles, uh, to its full extent. And so, what we're providing here is a software platform uh, to not only efficiently, efficiently, but also accurately uh, do radiation detection and mapping. And there's some unique uh, features that we, we include in our software platform. First and foremost is fully autonomous controls. So this allows us to have continuous monitoring and controlling of these unmanned vehicles, uh, as well as unattended controls. Second, uh, we have a unique and novel approach for optimizing our path trajectories for these unmanned vehicles. Uh, and we do this continuously and on the fly, uh, allowing us to have the best performance. And lastly, uh, we are scalable. So we have the ability to control multiple vehicles simultaneously, uh, which allows us to cover more ground and which also allows us to utilize our assets uh, to, uh, to the best of their abilities. And so the technology behind it uh, is framed, uh, is using a continuous framework for our uh, radiation detection and mapping. So we can acquire our sensor data. And of course we display the data uh, detection data or the map itself. And we use that to use our machine learning algorithm to predict the entire area. And then the idea behind that is we can learn from that prediction so that we can tell our unmanned vehicles uh, exactly where to go next so that we can improve on our uh, maps that we produce. Uh, so the way we envision this working is com by combining our software platform with actually commercially available hardware that's already out there. And again, the key aspects of Adaptimize is real-time data fusion, uh, our novel machine learning predictive mapping approach, as well as combining those two with optimal motion planning for these vehicles. So in the past year, we've really focused on creating this algorithm uh, and the core, the core algorithm to understand and show in simulations that Adaptimize uh, can produce radiation detection maps uh, with equal accuracy in less than half the time. Uh, here, traditional means uh, traditional in the sense of a uniform survey where you can go left and right, up and down. Uh, but again, because we're directing these vehicles exactly where they need to go to improve our maps, uh, we can see that we can decrease our time. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of practical benefits, what we have here is, of course, faster actionable information. So this allows us to have uh, follow on procedures that are uh, more informed, so informed strategies uh, and quicker so that we can have safer operations so that the operators don't have to be in the radiation field uh, longer than they have to be. And lastly, we improve our efficiency. So particularly for UAVs, uh, one of the limiting factors is the battery life and the flight time. And so in, because we are sending these vehicles exactly where they need to be, uh, we can actually improve our efficacy of producing these maps. Ultimately, what we offer is saving on cost, time, and effort uh, for operations in radi radiological and nuclear threat defense. So when we look at the total market, uh, so here in the US, uh, radiation detection and monitoring, we spend around $2.7 billion a year, and we expect this to grow to around $4 billion by 2026. Um, specifically looking at homeland security and defense, uh, the annual cost for what we call nuclear incident management, which includes mitigation, but also uh, follow-on procedures as well as response, is around $700 million. $700 million. And so focusing on the use of unmanned vehicles, we estimate the service obtainable market to be around $200 million. <clears throat> so who are we targeting in, in terms of customers? So we're really focused on uh, these already existing UAV service and drone companies that provide uh, the hardware as well as services, typically in the form of UAV operators and pilots that go on these sites. And what we really are trying to offer is first and foremost, direct implementation of Adaptomize to uh, what may be their existing software already. So we aim and we vision that this uh, software platform to be platform agnostic. Uh, secondly, we uh, wanna provide cost customization tools uh, for application specific needs, depending on if it's an open field or if it's more hard to reach places. And lastly, again, we're offering a full software suite which allows for uh, data map visualization, uh, but not only that, but with data diagnostics as well as management. So how do we take where Adaptomize is now uh, to the, uh, finally to the market? And so we're pretty early on in our stage of development. So last year, as I mentioned before, we, we focused on developing that core algorithm and testing it thoroughly in, in rigorous simulations. And so this year we are currently working on uh, demonstrating in field uh, an experiment that shows the use of Adaptomize with multiple different vehicles uh, so that we can have that experimental validation. Uh, and then moving forward, uh, we are focused on producing that software platform. Uh, so this includes uh, creating a user interface uh, with practicality in mind, as well as uh, the data visualization tools and the custom features. As we move forward, uh, once we have that software platform, uh, we are looking to distribute uh, through licensing and through hopefully our future partners. So ultimately what we're really looking for is an opportunity uh, to improve our ability to do RN threat defense. Uh, so we're looking for funding uh, currently for the development of that software platform. And we also wanna demonstrate on a large scale uh, practical demonstration with uh, large scale areas as well as hard to reach places. Uh, we're also seeking collaboration with government as well as private industries uh, so that we have a better idea of uh, where these, uh, where Adaptomize can be used uh, and benefit. Lastly, uh, we're looking for partners, ultimately for distribution, but also uh, product feedback as well as guidance uh, to where to move Adaptomize next in the future. And so with that, uh, I thank you all for listening and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Tony. Well done. We will give you a round of applause as well. Well done. Well done. Uh, I'll start and, and kick us off with questions. Again, uh, anybody in the audience that, ha that has them, please use that raise hand feature. Welcome to come off mute or also engage in the chat. You can put your questions right in directly, but I will have the honor of asking you the first question. Uh, so, you know, as you went through your problem, you know, diagnosing and predicting and using that machine learning to, to scope out those spaces, What's currently happening now? So what's different from what you guys can do with what is currently currently going on? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so currently, the, the most standard procedure for doing radiation detection and mapping is what we call a uniform survey routine. And so, for example, uh, at Fukushima, when we're doing uh, monitoring with UAVs, what they do is they have a single pilot driving a single UAV, uh, and they do a raster type motion where they go up and down, left and right. 
Um, depending on how large the area is, this could be a really time uh, consuming procedure where uh, sometimes we don't really care about the edges. Uh, when we, we're really focused on where the contamination is, is, is the most uh, severe. And so that is the standard approach. Uh, there's also approaches where uh, you can have um, pre-planned missions. So you can say, you know, the UAV goes to this waypoint and then so on and so forth. Uh, what we bring to the table is uh, that continuous and dynamic optimizing of our mission planning. And so the idea is learning from what we know so far so that we can move the vehicles into a better direction. Uh, so it's that continual learning and dynamic feed, feedback in real time. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple questions coming into the chat. So James asks, what non-ready applications, if any, do you envision or see? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I appreciate that question. And of, of course, uh, there's applications in, in multi different types of sensors, whether it be RGB, it can be LIDAR, thermal cameras, um, and things of that nature. Um, so we have explored those options uh, on the tech technology front uh, and the research development is it's really focused on the radiation detection application, but we envision that uh, we can do uh, what we call heterogeneous contamination so biological chemical. Um, as well as radiation and nuclear, combining that with RGB camera. And so that real time data fusion uh, can be implemented for different types of sensors. Great, thank you. And then uh, we have a question from Dua here in the chat as well. As founders, you want the first few people in your company to be passionate about the mission, highly skilled, and also keep the cost low. So what have been some of your hiring strategies if you're at that stage yet? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I wouldn't say we're quite at that stage. Um, but, you know, thinking about that, I think, you know, as a founder, I, the most important thing is, is being passionate, passionate about the mission and, and really believing in the technology. And so I think that would be the first thing we would look into. Uh, the second thing I would look into are people who are skilled in things that I'm not skilled in, right? Uh, so people who can bring um, other unique uh, aspects to the company, um, whether it be marketing, whether it be doing customer discovery, things like that. Um, and then lastly, uh, people who are uh, efficient uh, yet have pedigree behind their work, I think, uh, is really going to be a driver for keeping costs low. So, All right. Another question from Susan coming in. So who are your direct company customers? Who are your direct customers, service companies that are engaged in RN monitoring today? So she'd yeah. like to know who your direct customers. Yeah, so that I, I think you hit it. Uh, you hit it right on the spot. Um, so those are currently the the uh, customers that we're really focused on are these service companies uh, that provide um, UAV pilots and that also actually manufacture their own radiation detection hardware. Uh, what we want to provide is uh, a little bit, um, I guess, a, a benefit in terms of it'll be easier for those pilots to use. Um, our software platform rather than flying their own uh, UAVs or UGVs. Uh, what we're envisioning hopefully is some type of, you know, press go system where you can have one subject matter expert control multiple uh, aerial and ground vehicles simultaneously. Great. Well, thank you, Tony. We are going to move into our breakout room sessions at this point. So uh, everybody, again, please give it up for Tony and your virtual applause, but well done. Uh, and for all the postdocs, we're Eric, Tanya, Tony. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more information, we, of course, will be able to connect you uh, to their great companies. We're excited to see where they go from here, but congratulations. Well done. It was a six-month cohort, hundreds of hours here of work. So congratulations on your pitches. Uh, we appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody is going to be excited to talk to you directly here as we open up the breakout rooms. Uh, before we do that, a very quick shameless plug for us uh, in a similar vein and, and also with uh, the DOE and the NNSA, uh, we have the Frontier Venture Summit coming up next week, Thursday, 3 to 4.30 p.m. We're going to be highlighting a lot of great teams, a lot of great pitches as well with those breakthrough technologies. That link is in the chat if you'd like to register and join us. We'd hope to see you there. And then for the small business uh, or just any business folks that are on here as well, uh, we are hosting along with a lot of the DOE labs in the Bay Area, open the door to the partnership. So it's a three part event series at the end of April uh, at 12 p.m. Pacific or 3 p.m. Eastern. You'll hear about funding and opportunities, specific pathways to partnerships such as CRADAs, SPPs. We'll, we're going to get nitty gritty with some success stories of companies that have gone through that before. And then lastly, no cost connection. So how you can engage with national labs at no cost and Dr. Vanessa Chan will be speaking. So those links are in, please join us at those uh, two upcoming events.